I definitely think fighting has opened the path to redemption for me. For the vast majority, like 99% of the fighters, you have to become champion to be remembered by the sport and appreciated by the fans. Oh, I said I couldn't do it! Look at me now! A championship belt immortalizes you, and even if you lose 10 fights in a row, no one will be able to remove you from the history books as the undisputed UFC champion. To be the world champion is the reason I have to put on a pair of gloves. Not to make money or make a name. Everything else is great, but those are just um, byproducts of trying to be the best. But as with every other thing in life, there is an exception to the rule. It is possible to be illustrious without 10 pounds of gold, and this is how you accomplish it. Number one, be popular. Number two, win consistently. Number three, shed a lot of blood. Four, put on a war each time you step in the cage. And five, pay attention because this one is the most important one. Be Dustin the Diamond Poirier. I've overcome adversity so many times. If I can do it, you can do it. Welcome to the fighting business. 30 UFC fights, interim championship, countless wars and bonuses, a resume stacked with former champions and megastars. Dustin Poirier is one of the few guys that can claim that the sport, the company, and us, the fans, will never forget what he has done and accomplished. But allow me to present a demonstration in honor of Dustin Poirier, as we do for legends on TFB, a lengthy and in-depth dive into his career. I like to call them the before and after, where we take a look at the past opponents and let them describe the feeling of sharing the cage with the diamond. It's one thing to be confident before facing him. You're a former champion, you're a young, hungry phenom on the rise, or you're simply just a megastar. But the narrative can, and always seem to change after sharing the cage with Dustin Poirier. Anthony Pettis. The move to lightweight was beneficial for Dustin Poirier, who looked like a death on the scales at 145. He started off well and put together a win streak, but he hit a rough patch with a KO loss to Michael Johnson, a majority decision win over Jim Miller, and a no contest versus Eddie Alvarez. Didn't help that Connor was a lightweight too, but after eating an illegal knee to the face against Eddie, the UFC matched him up against former champion Anthony Pettis. This was a fight Pettis himself wanted, and while he was not the same guy he used to be, he was still a champion at one point, and as per the odds, the slight favor to win against Poirier. I think Pettis is the, the better fighter, yeah, yeah, I think he was gonna get the win for sure. After the bad ending to his last fight, Dustin Poirier had a lot to prove, and he showed up to the octagon with a chip on his shoulder. Maybe he was extra pissed off after the illegal knee because he put a beating on Pettis from the very start of the fight. Dominated on the feet and on the ground, Pettis was a bloody mess at the start of the third round, and that is where it ended, with Pettis tapping out to a body triangle. Pettis said it was due to a broken rib, but Poirier believed it was something else. It was a broken man more than a broken rib, but that's my thoughts, you know? Now on the right track, Dustin Poirier called out a guy very few fighters wanted to mess with, Justin Gaethje. After finishing a former champion in Anthony Pettis, Poirier moved into the top five of the division. There was no doubt that Poirier was better as a lightweight than he was a featherweight, but was he good enough to challenge for the title someday? He had to answer a few more questions, the foremost concerning his chin. He was knocked out cold by Michael Johnson not too long after all, and his next opponent was twice the menace Johnson was. I give him full credit, but I'm ready to take everything he's earned. Gaethje was a recent UFC addition. He won his debut fight, but suffered the first loss of his career to Eddie Alvarez. He was back four months later in his hometown, eager to test the durability of Poirier. Uh, no one is comfortable with me in, in the midst of chaos or in the pocket, uh, so... The more we're fighting in the pocket, you know, the more uncomfortable he's going to be. Ready to take everything Dustin had earned. The loss to Conor McGregor still haunted Dustin, and as long as the notorious one was in the title picture, Dustin was pretty much irrelevant. Maybe that is why Gaethje was asked more questions about Habib and Conor than his actual opponents. Well, he always talks shit about Conor not defending his belt, and if he wants to fight GSP, it will not be a lightweight. So he, therefore, will not be defending his belt, which is the same exact thing he's talking shit about. His actual opponent, however, was ready to move into title picture. In the main event of UFC on Fox 29, Dustin and Justin put on the show most expected them to. As most had predicted, they were closely matched, but Dustin was a step ahead until he was poked in the eye in the third round. The referee deducted a point from Gaethje, but Dustin didn't need the extra points as he wobbled Gaethje with a left hand early in the fourth and then beat the hell out of him with combos until the referee stepped in. This was the first fight where we really appreciated the killer instinct of Dustin. He was bloodied and damaged himself but he answered the lingering question. Yes, 
Dustin Poirier could withstand damage at 155. I give him credit. You know, he pulled through and gathered himself and came back strong. Nothing but respect. I got nothing but respect for him. Gaethje had all the respect in the world for the victor. And that night, even the biggest Conor and Habib fans had to respect the new guy in the already stacked title picture. Eddie Alvarez too. Poirier had defeated one of the most violent dudes at 155, but there was another guy who, not too long ago, called himself the most violent motherfucker in the world. His name was Eddie Alvarez, and Poirier did have some history with him. I saw his spear break, and that's the only reason he's begging for a rematch, because when you feel like you beat someone, you don't care to fight them again. You know more than anyone that when you start fucking me up, what happens? Rectification was in order. The illegal knee in the first fight robbed many of what was shaping up to be the fight of the night. And now with both of them coming off victories, the rematch made sense. And Alvarez, being a former world champion and all, gave Poirier a little chance in the rematch. I feel like he would have beat me that first fight. That was his best chance. The bad loss to McGregor was messing with Eddie, but now he was over it. And he was going to crush the undercard fighter in Dustin Poirier. Yeah, I think Poirier is more of an um, undercard fighter. Three five-minute rounds. The rematch started at a similar pace, and it was still even. Hilariously, in the second round, Eddie threw an illegal 12-6 elbow, and the referee stepped in. Deja vu, but the illegal strike likely gave Dustin rage induced PTSD. And when the referee resumed the action, he caught Eddie with a vicious left hand. And just like his last fight, he beat the hell out of his concussed opponent until the fight was over. Poirier had now corrected the no contest loss, and he added another former lightweight champion to his resume. Eddie commented on the fight a few days later and sort of hinted that the halt in action was to blame for the loss. But overall, he gave the victory to Dustin left the door open for a trilogy belt, but Dustin Poirier was on to bigger and better goals. But wait a minute, Conor McGregor absolutely murked Eddie Alvarez while it took Dustin effort to finish him. The stigma was still on. Max Holloway 2. Following UFC 229, the lightweight division was finally on track to normalcy. Well, sort of. Habib defeated McGregor and retained the title, but he also jumped the fence and got himself suspended. While the undisputed champion sat out, the UFC arranged an interim title. The most deserving lightweight was Dustin Poirier, but everyone else was in no position to compete for a title. And so the UFC called upon the featherweight champion, Max Holloway, to step up. And of course, Max was game. It is official, it is signed, an interim lightweight title fight between Max Holloway and Dustin Poirier will headline UFC 236 on April 13th. This was another rematch for Poirier back when he was at 145. He welcomed Max Holloway into the UFC and defeated him by submission. But Holloway was barely a teenager back then. Since the first fight, Max had become a champion at 145, defeated the great Jose Aldo back to back, and he made a solid case that he had the best chin and the best cardio in the UFC. I'm that guy, it happened, it happened. If we cross paths, we cross paths. Max that you guys are looking at today would have bodied 20 year old Max. I would have put him in a cemetery. Oh, one more thing. He did better against Connor than Dustin did. In some ways, this was Max's moment to rise to the top. He had pretty much dominated featherweight and he planned to do the same at 155. The number one pound for pound fighter should look dominant. That's in my mind. They should just be dominant in everything. So I want to go out there and dominate. Dustin had demonstrated skill, power, and chin, but he had yet to go all five rounds. And Max Holloway was the best conditioned fighter he had ever faced. Maybe power was on Dustin's sides, but now that Max was a fully grown adult, his pace and pressure was maybe too much for Poirier. I just need him to show up. I'll see you guys tomorrow night. But on fight night, cardio was not the most important factor. It was power. Dustin Poirier was the first guy to rock the previously invulnerable featherweight champion, and each time he landed clean, Max Holloway suffered, and his face began to reflect the damage. In the championship rounds, Holloway did push the pace, but it turns out that Poirier had a pretty decent gas tank as well. And four rounds to one, the diamond captured the interim championship. I'm back up like I said before, man, this is my belt, I earned this in blood, I was paid in full, this is mine. Max was sent straight to the hospital after the Octagon interview, but he later released a statement praising Dustin as a champion. 2-0 against Max Holloway and the first guy to beat him since 2013. Dustin Poirier was feeling good, but the title around his waist demanded unification, and so did Poirier. Two, I'll tell your boy to get his shit together. Two Nigerian born champions two. on the same night and two fucking <laughs> Dan Hooker. The unification belt did take place at UFC 242, and Poirier entered the octagon to make something special happen against the undefeated Dagestani. 
but with Habib's father at ringside, even DP had no chance. Dustin managed a flurry of punches in the second round, but Habib shrugged it off and eventually got his neck to force the tap out. It was a heartbreaking loss for Poirier, and you could not help but wonder, was he broken for good? You know, uh, hindsight's 2020. I just wonder if I could have maybe did more. Maybe I didn't try to get off the fence. I'm going to beat myself up about this for the rest of my life, you know. Uh, I don't know. Someone, a new prospect at 155, thought so, and he wanted to finish the burial. Dustin Poirier, I'm going to smash your face in. Meet me in New Zealand, 2020, and I'm going to end you. Poirier, with his accomplishment and his tenure, had gotten to the point where the new guys were calling him out, demanding that he defend his spots, and Dan Hooker happened to be the most vocal one. He's a higher ranked fighter that's ahead of me. Like, I want his head. I wanted to rip his head off. This was the typical new guy versus veteran dynamic. And to get the attention of Dustin, Dan Hooker had to talk a lot. I would fight Dustin Poirier any day of the week. Like that's, I think stylistically, it's a pretty tough fight for him. But I think it was his prediction that he would finish Dustin Poirier that annoyed the former interim champion the most. Poirier from watching his fights, I don't think he has the same poker face. I think when he's hurt, you can see it. I think when he's tired, you can see it. I don't think, I don't think he hides that very well. And I think I'm one of the best of the world at seeing that. Fighting Dan Hooker is not what's best for Dustin Poirier's career, trust me. By 2020, Dustin had been fighting in the UFC for a decade straight. He had been in some wars. He had climbed his way to the undisputed title shot, but was handed a brutal loss. This is the point where most, hell, almost everyone starts to slow down, but not this guy. Main event of UFC on ESPN 12, Hooker was where he wanted, in the cage with a former interim champion. It started off well for him. Hooker was not able to put Dustin Poirier away. The Habib loss was bad, but the mentality of Dustin was diamond. And in rounds three to five, Poirier served a demonstration to any new guy thinking that he was over the hill. How about that, Dan? How about that, Dan? Backstage, it was gruesome, and Dan Hooker was sent to the hospital on a stretcher. But this minor rivalry ended peacefully. It was a hard fought battle, but it made one thing clear. Dustin Poirier was not going anywhere anytime soon. Conor McGregor. He beat Eddie. Conor did it better. He beat Holloway, but Conor did it better. He lost to Habib. Conor also did it better. By now, Dustin Poirier was one of the most celebrated lightweights, despite never having won the undisputed title. But no matter how many wins he got, he was still considered to be a step below the notorious Conor McGregor. Years ago, these two fought at 145, and McGregor clowned Poirier in the buildup. His chin is deteriorating. Every single contest he gets in, he hits one knee. A gust of wind, and he does the chicken dance. You know what I mean? And then finished him. Poirier had sort of gotten over the loss, but the fans didn't forget. To be remembered as the lightweight great he was shaping up to be, Poirier had to get that loss back. And luckily for him, he eventually got the chance. Very excited to be here, very ready. And yeah, let's get it going. McGregor 2.0 was the next lightweight champion after he beat Donald Cerrone. But before Dana White could push him for a title shot, he needed one more win. Poirier, someone he had defeated before, was available. And the rematch was set for UFC 257. This was during the nice Connor gimmick, so the former double champion had nothing but good things to say about Dustin. Dustin has put on an incredible run since our last fight. It's been a long time coming. Yes, I did get the win over him the first time. Um, but, you know, he's rose right up and he's, he's back up there at the top of the division. So I'm excited to go on and compete with him again. But even the respectful Connor doubted that Dustin could stand and trade with him. He still had the touch of death in his left hand. And McGregor saw the result of the rematch being no different than last time. So I'm going to go in there and... I believe, I believe I can get him out there and possibly will hit him early and hurt him. Someone's going to be able to stay in the pocket with me and stay in there and fight with me. Do I think so? I, I do not. I'm in, I'm in some shape here at the minute and I tell you this now, I am coming to put on a masterpiece. But at 155, Dustin Poirier took that left hand shot he was not able to endure years ago. Connor was not able to deal with the calf kicks and in the second round, the unthinkable happened. I don't know what was more surreal. The fact that Connor was knocked out or that Dustin had avenged his loss seven years later. But finally, he was free of the Conor McGregor shadow looming over him. But right after this victory, Dustin called for the trilogy. 
and Connor decided to shift back into his regular persona. Being a nice guy didn't work, so he decided to revive the animosity for the trilogy bout. I guess you hadn't reached out regarding the charity, and this seemed to bother you, he right? He jumped the gun, is what he done. And boy was it turned up a notch from 2013. I think the loss damaged Conor McGregor in more ways than one, because he turned straight up psychotic. He was no longer looking to win. He straight up wanted to murder Dustin for ruining his reputation. Do you think he's changed? I don't give a fuck about him, to be honest. It's just how I am. He's, he's a corpse, a body, a blank face. It's gonna get his ass whooped and took out on a stretcher. And just like that, we were looking at a grudge match to decide the trilogy. There was a lot of free. There was a lot of freebies given. There was a lot of free things given. There was there was there was weight on the scales given. There were shots in the octagon given. There was plugs and support given. There's nothing free given this time. Everything is getting took. Nothing free was given this time, he said, because Connor was done being nice and playing games. And in the final face-off, it was far more intense than ever before. And with the whole world watching, Connor reiterated his promise. Well, I'm gonna make this man pay with his life, and I mean it. You're that off the gun tomorrow night. On fight night, karma was a mirror. It was evident that Dustin had surpassed Connor in every way possible, and Connor was the first one to take a step back, first one to shoot for a takedown and go for a submission. At the end of the first round, Connor took a step back, shattered his foot, and that was the end of the trilogy. Two to one, Dustin Poirier, but McGregor was not ready to let go just yet. Your wife is in me. Ironically, Connor was the one left on a stretcher that night, and from what we know about him and his personality, the loss and the way the fight ended haunts Connor McGregor to this day. Michael Chandler. After the back to back victories over Connor McGregor, Dustin once again challenged for the lightweight title, and the champion this time was Charles Oliveira. Poirier had his moments, but he was submitted in the third round with a rear naked choke, again. Two championship losses meant that Dustin would not be fighting for the title anytime soon, but he was a big enough start to pick his fights at 155. There were a lot of big names. One in particular, Michael Chandler, was someone Dustin wanted to fuck up. But this is just it. The, the, the way he answered that question is not who he was a few interviews ago with Ara Hawani, or it's not who he was when the mic's in front of him in, in the octagon. For some reason, Dustin labeled Michael Chandler as fake, but Aaron Mike fired back. That Dustin Poirier went on record on the on the microphone after the fight and said, if the UFC wants me to fight Michael Chandler, I would, I'd just as soon go help s sell hot sauce. Two professionals and two of the nicest guys in the company disliked each other. That was one reason to look forward to the fight at UFC 281. But in the grand scheme, this was do or die for the veteran lightweights. Whoever lost this fight was going to say goodbye to their championship dreams, and Chandler thought he wanted it more. Not, not, nothing against him, but I think I want it more than anybody in this lightweight division. The whole buildup was like this, sort of professional, but there was definitely some underlying tension. It's gonna be a fun one. Let's go. Let's get what they want. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, let's go. They weren't screaming at each other, but every interaction was intense, like they wanted to rip each other's head off. The fight did not disappoint. It was entertaining, chaotic, and bloody. But during the fight, Dustin found another reason to dislike Michael Chandler. A headbutt strikes to the back of the head, fish hooking and literally blowing his bloody nose on Poirier. Chandler cheated multiple times, but after a big slam in the third, Poirier showed off his ground game and won the fight by rear naked choke. He won, but he still had something to say to Chandler. You stuck your fingers on my you know Told him he's a dirty motherfucker too. For putting his fing for putting his fingers in my mouth and blowing his nose and you know. Chandler tried to defend himself, and I can sort of get it. I will admit, I will admit yes, his mouth was open and my hand went inside of there and was on his mouthpiece. Some was said and I didn't really like it, so we're uh, we're still friends slash enemies slash whatever we are. It was likely desperation that pushed him to fish hook Poirier as he was not prepared to consider his championship dreams dead. But with the loss, it was over for him. Dustin Poirier was still alive in the division and by putting on yet another show at MSG, his star power only grew. Benoit Saint-Denis. At UFC 291, two bad motherfuckers, Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje competed for the BMF title. This was a rematch of their 2018 encounter, a fight that was destined to happen again, but 
Unfortunately for Poirier, Gaethje avenged a loss and brutally knocked him out with a kick to the head. This was not for the actual title and only a symbolic belt, but that was still three losses and three championship fights, and Poirier was not sure there was anything left for him in the game. I don't know what's going to happen next. I really don't. I don't think that far. What am I fighting for? I'm not fighting just to fight. I did that my whole life. My whole life I've done that. But eventually and thankfully, Dustin came back looking for a fight. He had fought the more popular contenders already, and with most of the division locked, only one name was available to him, Benoit Saint-Denis. Yeah, it's a guy that has been around for a long time. I like his state of mind. I'm very happy and honored to be his opponent. It was now on Poirier to defend his status as a top contender at lightweight. Uh, that the guy uh, comes from a loser, he has to defend his position. He had been here before, and he had defended against Dan Hooker, but Benoit was a completely different beast. Benoit Saint-Denis is on the rise. Yeah. He's the younger fighter, he's the fresher fighter, and he's on a tear right now. So I think they're looking at just what have you done lately yeah. in things. Yeah. Benoit is a classy guy, so there was no beef or trash talk between the two. The story of this bout was simple, veteran fighter versus top prospect. We had seen a handful of these matchups in the past few years, Gaethje against Fazeev, Dariush versus Gamrot, but Benoit on paper seemed like the worst matchup out of all the new guys, and Saint-Denis was looking for blood. I know it's gonna be a bloody battle. And he is as well, so yeah, let's, let's give the people the fight they, they expect and uh, have fun uh, in there. Poirier, as great as he was, did struggle with fighters who pressured with their grappling. Oliver and Habib had submitted him, and as per the odds, Benoit, the minus 200 favorite, was likely going to do the same. This was Poirier's 30th fight in the company, and according to some, this was going to be his last. A loss here, and there was no hope left for him ever becoming the undisputed champion. Benoit started the fight like a demon out of hell. He pressured the veteran from the start, mixed in grappling, and he got Poirier down a few times. It looked bad at one point, but Dustin was starting to find his range. Whenever they traded, Poirier treated Benoit like a punching bag. The initial burst by Benoit could not get Dustin out of there, and in the second round, Poirier found his chance and sent Benoit to the shadow realm with a right hand. This was the first time Saint-Denis had been finished in his career. And with this victory, Poirier once again, just as he did against Dan Hooker, silenced everyone who thought he was done, not by a long shot. We've seen this dude grow throughout the years, not just as a fighter, but as a person. In 2014, Dustin Poirier was a respectable featherweight with decent boxing skills, but he was easy to rattle, as Conor McGregor proved, and while he was a good fighter, not too many people were going to pay to see him compete. It's 2024 now, and Dustin Poirier is arguably one of the best boxers in the company, a superstar, a legend in the 155 pound division, and maybe, personally I think so, the best fighter ever to never win the undisputed title. And considering the list we have gone through, the wars he has taken part in, the souls he has taken, the names he has beaten, don't be surprised if this guy, Dustin the Diamond Poirier, ends up capturing the undisputed title and bows out the game as one of the greatest lightweights of all time. Get YouTube SEO Masterclass, editing, breakdowns, all previous and upcoming videos, music, playlists, downloadable thumbnails, your name in these wonderful credits, and so much more on Patreon. Have a look at it right here. And with that being said, I gotta bounce. I'll catch y'all in the next one. Peace out.